Hi everyone, and welcome to another Cincinnati Museum Center Facebook Live. Uh, I'm Bob Genheimer, the George Revisual Curator of Archaeology here at the Museum Center, and I will be your host for the day. Uh, so what I want to do is talk a little bit about what I do here at the museum, uh, talk about some of our fabulous archaeology and ethnographic collections, uh, our Han Field School collections in Field School, uh, and answer any questions you have about me uh, or what I do. Uh, so let's start with uh, what I actually do uh, at the museum. Uh, so uh, my job is to supervise a whole bunch of things and coordinate a lot of things. So let's take a closer look at some of those items. Uh, so first of all, um, I supervise the volunteers, the college interns, adjunct curators, researchers, etc. Uh, and number one in that group is the volunteers. So we have more than a dozen volunteers now uh, who are really want to get back in here and do some work for us. Uh, they, these people do everything. So you always hear about the romance part of archaeology. The volunteers do the non-romantic parts. So they're doing the washing, the sorting, the numbering, flotation, reboxing, all those things that we need to have done uh, so that we can be a productive department. Uh, and they've been doing that for decades here. Uh, I have been here for 30 years, at least in August. Will be, this is my 30th year. Uh, and I probably have had over 150 volunteers in our lab or in the field. So they're extremely important to what we do. Uh, also, college interns. Uh, typically, we have between two and four per semester. Uh, up to double that in the summer when we have our field schools or lab schools. Um, and this is designed as a real world learning experience for them. Uh, so they get to work on a lot of things where they wouldn't have access to. Uh, they learn uh, field techniques, they learn uh, lab techniques, they learn about uh, material culture uh, and those sorts of things as well. Um, we also have adjunct curators. Uh, and these are local researchers or sometimes not even local who use our collections uh, when they're doing research. Uh, one of the best examples is uh, Ted Sunderhouse, uh, who is one of our unit chiefs in our field school, and is currently working on this large study of domestic dogs at the Han site. And someday when we have time, we'll talk a little more about that, but it's actually pretty cool. There's a lot of dogs there, uh, and we're trying to understand the use of the dogs, how all this played out, but uh, let's just say that uh, we have a minimum number of vendors of probably 200 dogs at the Han site that we're working on. So that's pretty exciting to us. Uh, also, the last one is researchers. So we have a lot of researchers, and this includes students and colleagues, who utilize our collections for research. So it is incumbent upon us to have those collections in a state where they're ready to study. Uh, so a lot of our work here is involved in doing that, making sure things are where they're supposed to be, that they're cataloged, that they're in a database system, so people can actually use the collection successfully. Uh, so we have some uh, questions here. Let's answer one of these uh, questions. Um, <clears throat> why is archaeology important to the Cincinnati area is the first one I see come up here. Uh, really, when, you, when they say Ohio is the heart of it all, when you're talking about archaeology, uh, Southern Ohio is probably pretty much the center of the universe in the United States uh, for the history of archaeology. This is where all these enormous sites were, mound sites, earthworks, uh, uh, all these village sites. So in the 19th century, this is where people, uh, archaeologists, cut their teeth working on, on this material. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a lot of important sites, including our field school site, the Han site. Uh, these are nationally significant sites. So Cincinnati sits at pretty much the center of that, and our collections here embody that uh, significance. We have very fabulous collections in some of this, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, so uh, next question, to Charlie Harper on here. Uh, what are some of the biggest challenges in your field and why? I think um, just time uh, and money trying to get things done. Uh, there's just too much stuff, and when we talk about the Han site um, here in a moment, the work that we do there, um, there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pieces that have come out of the ground. That all takes a lot of time to do. Just getting that washed up, sorted, cataloged, and then, of course, writing it up at the end. So those sorts of things 
uh, can take a lot of time. Uh, so that's probably one of the biggest challenges uh, that we have. Also, technology, which we'll talk about a little bit maybe here in a minute. Uh, the, the, all that stuff, the technology is expensive, and it's, it's getting more, um, more and more needed today for uh, the type of archaeology that needs to be done. Uh, so that can uh, also be a challenge, getting some of the equipment or access to the equipment and people who know how to run it uh, to do the archaeology as well. So, uh, so let's um, move on. Uh, so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about coordinating our own research here at the museum. Um, so much of this has to do with our ongoing field school research at the Han site. Uh, so I actually do a lot of cataloging, and when I say that, I do a lot of cataloging. Uh, and I've just been working on a cataloging when we were in the lockdown, uh, finishing some of this stuff up. Uh, we are at nearly 750,000 pieces from the Han site alone. Uh, we've been there 12 years. That only includes uh, eight or nine of those years uh, that have been cataloged. So there's well over a million, maybe 1.2 million items from the site. Uh, so I spend a lot of time trying to do that because it's, it's incumbent upon us to keep up with that sort of stuff. Um, I also do um, a lot of photography. Uh, so uh, we're always trying to increase and better our digital assets. And if there's one thing that the pandemic and the lockdown taught us, uh, was we need to be better at that. We need to have a better handle on what we have digitally so that we can use them when we don't have the objects sitting in front of us. Um, so that's really important and that's since we've been back in here in the office for the last couple of weeks, we've been working on digital assets and making sure that we have some of those things together that we can uh, have access to uh, pretty much at a moment's notice. Uh, exhibit work is another thing that uh, I do. So we just finished working on a couple of new exhibits that have archaeology content in them. They're minor content, uh, but they will be opening next month, and this includes You Are Here and Shaping Our City. Uh, so look out for those. They're fabulous exhibits. Uh, I can't wait to see them again. I saw them briefly before we did the shutdown, but uh, I want to go back in and look at them again. They're really well done. Uh, and. Um, the museum staff and our outside contractors did a fabulous job on that. Hope to see you people there to look at those exhibits. Uh, <clears throat> but we're also uh, beginning to plan future archaeology exhibits, <clears throat> and uh, I'm really excited about that. Uh, and we may take, uh, talk a little bit about that in a moment as well. Another aspect of the job here uh, at the museum in archaeology is NAGPRA work uh, for those of you who don't know what NAGPRA is, it's a Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act that was passed into law in 1990. Essentially, it tries to connect um, museum and other institutional collections with uh, human remains, uh, sacred items, items of cultural patrimony, funerary objects, with descendant communities. So it's a process where you try to identify who those descendant communities are, and in the Midwest, that's a difficult thing to do. Uh, hopefully a number of you tuned in two weeks ago uh, today when uh, Tyler Swinney, our NAGPRA coordinator, uh, gave an excellent talk on NAGPRA uh, and described what we do. But essentially we have about 13 or 14 tribal partners. We are about to have more. Uh, and our number one goal is to repatriate these Native American human remains to the appropriate tribe or consortium of tribe. That's what we want to do. They don't belong with us they belong back with them uh, back in the ground. So that's what we're trying to make happen. Uh, also, we do writing and publishing. Uh, it is important to write up our research. So we are current, constantly working on that aspect and it can take a lot of time. Um, and then representation, one of the, the final things. Uh, so we don't exist uh, in a world with nothing else in it. So I represent the museum uh, or archaeology as a board member on several organizations. So I am a trustee with the Ohio, Archaeologi or Ohio Archaeological Council, which is the professional group in Ohio. Uh, I am also a trustee with Heartland Earthworks Conservancy, which is a group which tries to acquire or facilitate the acquisition of earthworks in Ohio, which there are many, many, many. Uh, so we try to go behind the scenes and, and do that. 
And I'm also a recent board member on the Archaeological Research Institute out of Lawrenceburg, Indiana, uh, where they're trying to do educational material, a lot of it centered around the guard site, one of these uh, major Fort Ancient sites um, out just right outside of Lawrenceburg uh, in Indiana at the mouth of the uh, Great Miami River. So I'm on all these sort of boards. So th those sorts of things, those connections are important as well. Um, so uh, let's talk about uh, our collections here at the museum uh, briefly. So um, we have both prehistoric and historical archaeology collections here. So the prehistoric collections, which are the bulk of it, um, are dominated by late prehistoric or Fort Ancient Age collections from the last millennium. So after AD 1000, but most of our collections are probably after AD 1200 or 1300. Uh, so these are, this is the last gas of Native Americans in this area before everything is disrupted by Europeans uh, arriving, uh, moving them out, disease, and so forth. Uh, so we house collections from more than 20 Fort Ancient Villages in the Cincinnati area. Some of these collections go back to the middle of the 19th century. Uh, they are large collections, many from multi-year excavations. So we also have collections from other time periods as well, uh, which are very useful. Uh, we also, one of our strengths is our synoptic or type collections. So these include spear points, bifaces, ground stone tools, slate objects, pipes, pottery vessels, etc. And I thought I would take a few minutes here to show you uh, some of this material. Uh, there's actually some fabulous pieces, but we're just going to show you a few just to uh, whet the appetite a little bit. So here's uh, a nice little um, rim section of a pottery vessel. Uh, this is probably uh, 13th century, 14th century AD. Uh, Fort Ancient, uh, and it's a little hard to see, but if you look, it has a design on the neck right here. Uh, this is called guillotine. It's a ribbon pattern that goes in and around and around and a nice big strap handle. So this is a section of a vessel uh, that probably stands about a foot and a half tall when it was the, the whole vessel was there. So we can tell a lot from these little shards. Uh, they tell us what's going on. If you look, you can see the white flecks in it that is a mussel shell they're tempering the pottery with. Uh, we also have uh, stone objects, so I brought some, uh, this is an axe uh, that you can see. Um, uh, this is a small one, they get very big and they, get, they weigh a lot, but uh, I didn't want to cart one all the way up here, but you can see these would have been hafted, these are used for woodworking, cutting down trees, that sort of thing. Um, a similar object, uh, which is called a celt, so it, it doesn't have the groove in it, so it would have been halved it. If you can consider my hand uh, a stick or a shaft. Uh, and these are for even finer woodworking. Uh, and these are made out of igneous or metamorphic rock. Uh, sometimes they chip them first and they essentially peck them and grind them into place uh, and polish them. Um, pretty cool stuff. So we also have uh, lots of spear points. So some optic collections, I brought some of these that you can see. Um, there's a little glare on here, but uh, there's some stemmed and uh, corner notch points on here. These are dating um, to about AD 1 to maybe AD 1000. Um, also, we have some others here. So big ones, small ones. The little ones are what we call late archaic in age. So they're maybe 1000, 1500, 2000 BC. So you're talking 4,000 years ago. These are, these are not young. Uh, and some earlier, uh, larger points up top. Um, also, some of the, my favorites, and when I'm working at the Han site, which I'm obsessed with late prehistoric culture, we have the bow and arrow, and that's what these are. So these little flint triangular points are from the bow and arrow. Uh, and these are found in really, really large numbers. They're easy to make. They don't require much flint to do it. And well over a thousand of them have been recovered from our excavations at the Han site uh, over the 12 years. Um, and I also uh, get excited about uh, things that I think show the humanity of this material. Sometimes we look at these as artifacts, but these are real people 
who are making them. And so there's here's a few objects that um, I find I'm deeply interested in and can identify with. And this, um, if I can get it up here, uh, is a little rim rider on a pottery vessel from the Madisonville site, one of the, the most well-known sites in eastern North America, which is now in the village of Marymount. And you can see this incredible face on it. Um, I, every time I look at that, I just have to stare at it and wonder who made this and what does it represent. Uh, some other uh, similar items. Uh, this, if I can get it in the image here, this is the rim of a vessel here, a ceramic vessel, and you can see this individual is climbing up with his hand over the lip of the vessel peering inside, um, and this is really, really cool. I just absolutely love this piece. And here is a similar one um, here that you can see, although this may not be a person, it may be something else, but it's also clutching, uh, would have been clutching the top of the rip. These are appliques that were made separately and then kind of smushed on to the, the vessel surface itself. Um, why don't we look at some questions here. Um, so somebody wants to know what are some books or other resources uh, to look at to learn more about your field, the archaeology um, in this area. So there's a lot of uh, books uh, uh, that have come out uh, and I would ask anyone um, if, if you're looking at this, the easiest thing to do would be to email me uh, it's uh, B. Genheimer at CincyMuseum.org. Uh, you can find me on um, our webpage. And I can send you a list of some of, this, uh, some of these books uh, that can tell you some of this stuff. Uh, there's no, obviously, there's no one book that covers everything, so it would require um, a list uh, pretty much uh, to do that. So um, somebody's asking me, who was George Rivashol and how did your position come to be named uh, after him. <clears throat> so George Rivashol was um, a doctor, physician in World War II. He was a medic um, in the Army. And when he came back to Cincinnati, uh, he was at uh, University of Cincinnati Med School. Uh, and he and another colleague were working on uh, antihistamines. Uh, and they had discovered this um, po pretty powerful antihistamine uh, that George was excited about. Uh, uh, essentially, the, his partner wasn't that interested in pursuing it. Uh, so essentially, George took it uh, to uh, Park Davis, a pharmaceutical company in Detroit. Uh, he had the patent on uh, this antihistamine uh, and became the vice president of Park Davis uh, as well. This antihistamine, <laughs> which has an extremely long name that word wraps three lines uh, is better known as Benadryl. So he pretty much invented Benadryl um, and pretty much spent uh, the last uh, years of his life um, being a philanthropist uh, and uh, endowing lots of stuff. He came to us, he was interested in archaeology, I had known that because uh, we had um, have talked a little bit uh, and he essentially endowed the position which is why position is named the George Rivashel Curator of Archaeology. Uh, so what else do we have here? Um, what is your favorite artifact found at the Han site so far? Uh, and this is from Valerie. Uh, thanks for that question, Valerie. Uh, and I have a perfect answer for you, Val, because it's sitting right here. This is, it's hard to do these in reverse, this is a elk antler hoe so you're looking at it, you're looking at the downside, look how thin that is. So as you know, elk antlers are a little more spatulate than deer antlers, but we think these have been processed. We think they have split these antlers. They've got them wet. They've heated them and flattened them so that they have this flat. So here's the business end of this. So if you look, if we get this up here, this right here, so, um, and here's a hole where it's been hafted. I mean, I just love this piece. It's enormous. It's also notched down here. Um, so this would have been on a handle. So if you can imagine uh, my hand as a handle. But the thing I like most, and again, this gets back to the humanity part of this, uh, is these two holes. 
that you see right there. So this piece split on them, and in order to save it, they drilled two holes, lashed it together, and it's still together when we found it. So that lashing worked. Uh, so yeah, this is one of my favorite pieces, Val, and thanks for asking the question. Let's see. Um, so um, let's move on a little bit here. So uh, let's talk about historical archaeology. We talked about the prehistoric stuff. So we also do historical archaeology here as well, uh, which is one of my favorite fields because it, uh, historical archaeology actually weds history and archaeology together or, or history and anthropology. So the nice thing about historical archaeology is there, you can look up things. There are records. <clears throat> so I can go to a book and look things up. It's hard to do that with prehistoric stuff where there are no living witnesses to the people who left the material. So there's, you have to use analogies and historical inferences and all sorts of other stuff to deal with that. But the historical stuff, a lot of times you can look things up. You can see when things were manufactured. Let me show you a few pieces that get my heart beating faster here. Uh, and this one is, uh, in fact, all this stuff is from Privy Shafts, downtown Cincinnati. So you can see this beautiful scroll flask, uh, or sometimes referred to as a violin flask because of its shape. Uh, on the bottom, it has a glass rod pommel mark. So this dates to probably 1815, 1820, uh, maybe 1825. Uh, a really cool piece, intact, uh, except for a few breaks here, which we glued back together. Uh, so this was found uh, near the base of a privy shaft, which starts about 1840. Uh, an absolutely cool piece about the history of Cincinnati. Uh, another bottle that I love is this one. Um, and this one says H. Guy Ginger Pop on it, Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, it, the bottle itself is quite beautiful. The shape, it has an applied lip. Uh, this is a little later, maybe 1840s, 1850s, 1855. And this one uh, has a pommel mark on the bottom, but a bare iron pommel. Uh, you can see the metal mark uh, on it here as well. So to me, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, also, uh, I know you all uh, love yellowware. I do. It's one of my favorite things, and any of you guys have been to my house, you've seen uh, I have some. So this is a chamber pot, also from one of these privy shafts. Uh, this dates to about 1840 to 1845, and it has this very avant-garde uh, work on it. Um, these are actually cat's eyes that are sort of uh, flowing or moving. Uh, this is commercially produced pottery. You can see it has a handle on it. So chamber pots, what you would expect to find. Uh, in a privy shaft, and we qu find quite a few of them. Um, and finally, another one of my favorite pieces, and many of you have seen this before, but this is a spittoon. It's Rockingham. It's a yellower piece, but it has this manganese glaze on it. And around the top here, it says, please spit in the box. I think it's just absolutely lovely. Uh, what a sentiment they have sitting on your floor. Please spit in the box. And uh, that, I think, brings us to our ethnographic materials. So we have cultural items from all over the world in our ethnographic collections. Uh, one of my favorite uh, collection areas. So much of this is derived from Cincinnatians who travel the world. They collect it, and they bequeath the collections to us, um, either upon their death or prior to that. So we have all this fabulous stuff from around the world. Uh, so some of our fabulous collections include, as many of you know, the Fleshman family uh, collection from their cruise around the world and the Camargo in 1931 and 1932. Uh, and there's almost uh, uh, a thousand pieces from that alone. Also, we have large collections from Louis Kotlow, who uh, traveled the world his entire life and strived to go to places where no one had ever been to see the remotest places and people on the planet and then collect things from there as well. 
So I brought a couple of things from our ethnographic collections for you to see. Um, well, this is one of my favorite pieces. This is a Zuni pot. And if you look, it's an owl. Um, isn't that a sweet face or what? So this dates to probably uh, the first half um, of the 20th century. Um, you can see it has these little circles or targets all around it. Um, it sits uh, very nicely uh, because it has a tail that goes down as a sort of a tripod leg. Absolutely a gorgeous piece. Um, also, a moccasin. This is a Lakota Sioux moccasin. Uh, you can see also beat it uh, on the base of the moccasin as well. Uh, and it has some calico fringe on the back. Uh, we have uh, maybe three or four dozen moccasins in our collections, Native American, most of them from the plains. And finally, one of my favorite pieces. Uh, this is from the Adair collection from Brazil, collected in the 1980s. These, these were actually made in the 1980s. This is a feathered loincloth, if I can bring this back so you can kind of see the whole thing. I don't know what your computer screen is doing, but or your phone, but the colors on this are exquisite. There are a dark black, a blue black, a brown black, sort of like dog colors. There are probably 15 of these in our collection, most of them with very spectacular, vibrant colors. This one is my favorite because it's so simple. It always stood out to me. Uh, as being one of the best ones there. So um, it's one of the reasons why I brought it in here. So, um, what other questions are here? <clears throat> Whatever animals have you found at local dig sites, horses, cats, any unique animals? Uh, <clears throat> well, we don't uh, get horses in prehistoric uh, material. We do get cats in the form of both uh, bobcats and uh, mountain lions. So uh, they're, they're not that common, but we, we have got both of them at Han. Uh, we've gotten bobcat jaws, uh, and we will get uh, parts of uh, mountain lions as well. So both of them are here, uh, and both of them would still be here, except we simply don't tolerate them, and we've gotten rid of most of their um, area that they, they could actually survive in. Um, let see, what else do we have? So there's a question, where do igneous and metamorphic rocks come from in the Cincinnati area? <clears throat> so almost all of these rocks are coming uh, from uh, glacial deposits from the Canadian Shield. So they're being pushed down here. Uh, as many of you know, Cincinnati sits on a Cincinnati, it's on the Cincinnati Arch. Uh, so uh, we only have shale and limestone here, um, but these igneous and metamorphic rocks are common. Uh, so they show up uh, as part of this sort of glacial train that is being pushed down here. And sometimes these are fairly large. And they're strong rocks. So we objects are being made out of those that require some strength. It, particularly if you're hammering or battering, limestone simply won't uh, leave up to that. Let's see, anything else here? Somebody asked, what's the reason for an applique? That's how they were actually putting these uh, little figures on. Uh, so here's the back side of it. You can see it's flat. Here's the other side, um, which is the other side. So <laughs> they were actually made separately and then placed on the pot, which had already already been finished. Uh, so that's the reason why they are done as appliques. But as we all know, appliques or things that are put on tend to fall off. And that's what has happened in these cases. The appliques have separated from the vessel body. What is the strangest thing you've ever found uh, at uh, a dig site? Um, boy, that's a tough one. So this is a question uh, from Emily. Uh, I think one of the most interesting things is that we have found um, Carolina parakeet beak at the Han site. Uh, as many as you know, the Carolina parakeet is a now extinct bird, uh, one of the uh, only true parakeets in the US. Actually, I have a little pipe here uh, which is in the shape of a Carolina parakeet. So that beak that you see there in the front, which is a very characteristic beak, 
is what we found at the Han site on a bone. So when you find something like that, when it's an extinct animal, and that's as far as I know the only one that we've seen, that's pretty cool uh, to do that. So maybe not the strangest thing, Emily, uh, but certainly one of the most interesting things. Have I ever seen Sasquatch tracks or bones? No, I have not, and I hope I never do. But thank you for the question. Okay, um, we're at a half an hour here, people. Uh, I think I've answered uh, most of the questions here, uh, except not. I have one more in from Erin. She wants to know, isn't the Carolina parakeet one of the animals on the plates uh, from Newtown? She's talking about the shell gorgets and Yes, one of the uh, most recent shell gorgets uh, that came out uh, of Newtown about four years ago uh, has a com composite animal or a chimera on it. Uh, and that animal uh, uh, we believe to be part panther and part Carolina uh, parakeet. So it has a parakeet head, body, feathers, so forth, but the uh, visible foot and the big bushy tail suggests that it's a panther. So a mixture of an up, uh, upper world and lower world or underwater spirit on those two. So very good, Aaron, for catching that. So that's another instance of, uh, of seeing that. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, sort of close this out uh, just to say that uh, if you want more information about what we do and activities, not only archaeology but the Museum Center, please check out our website at cincymuseum.org and follow us on, on social media. We would appreciate if you did that. Uh, I can't tell you how much we miss you at Union Terminal, and we can't wait to see you back at the museum when it reopens in mid-July. As a nonprofit organization, we rely on ticket sales to operate, and of course, that is not possible right now. So if you enjoyed this presentation, I hope you'll support Cincinnati Museum Center by donating at cincymuseum.org. Uh, so thanks. And I hope to see you all real soon at the museum. Goodbye.